Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome from the heart of Central Texas. It is 7.30 on a Tuesday night, <laughs> and it's time for Breaking the Chain. Tonight, we've, we're going to be talking about maintenance-induced failures with our featured guest, Mike Bush. My name is Jeremy Walters. I'm an ATP. I have five type, type ratings, Master CFI. I'm a major in the United States Army Reserves, aviation content creator. I love to present. I love to uh, affect. I love to influence and help people be better than themselves. Uh, this is a photo whenever I was uh, on active duty flying the 864 and myself out teaching floats in uh, Lake Buchanan, Texas. I, I'm supported uh, by my beloved family. That's my wife, Talia, and our five kids and my uh, Luscom 8E that I keep in Temple. Tonight, I'm also going to be assisted by a very familiar face that's been on this program, Eric Day. Eric is an instrument-rated private pilot, aircraft owner, and software engineer, and he uh, part owner in a Mooney Juliet. All right, tonight, our guest speaker has, uh, he needs no uh, introduction, but to talk a little bit about him, Mike is uh, an author of four maintenance books. He uh, is a prolific writer. Um, he's an AMP, IA, CFI, II, uh, MEI, 8,000 hours. He was awarded by the FAA Administrator in 2008, the FAA uh, National Aviation Mechanic Technician of the Year. And he gives out free webinars and seminars, uh, donates his time. And his company, Savvy Aviation, is basically like the on-call uh, uh, on call um, record service, if you will, he, you can pick up the phone and call Savvy Aviation and get aviation advice. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to welcome our featured guest this evening, Mr. Mike Bush. Mike, welcome to Breaking the Chain, sir. So, uh, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy gave me uh, freedom to talk about whatever I felt like talking about tonight. So I thought I would talk a little bit about one of my favorite subjects, which is uh, maintenance-induced failures. Um, you know, every aircraft owner, and I've been an aircraft owner for better than 50 years now, uh, but we've all had the experience of putting an airplane in the shop for maintenance, uh, whether it's a well change or an annual or anything in between, then getting the airplane back out of the shop to discover that something that used to work fine no longer does. Um, and that's really what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, it's the, the dark side of maintenance, the, the, the side that we don't hear people talk about very much, especially mechanics don't talk about this very much. But but since although maintenance is supposed to make our airplane safer and more reliable, all too often it accomplishes exactly the opposite. Uh, maintenance sometimes breaks airplanes. Um, and when something in an aircraft fails due to something that a mechanic did that he shouldn't have done, or something that he failed to do that he should have done, um, I refer to it as a maintenance-induced failure, uh, or MIF for short. So we talk about MIFs, and uh, the terms, actually, I introduced this term about 20 years ago, and it, uh, it seems to be catching on because I hear a lot of people using this, this phrase now. Um, if, if I'm in a bad mood, I'll call it a mechanic-induced failure, but usually I use the more neutral term, maintenance-induced failure. But it's a, it's, it's a maintenance oops that caused something uh, to not work. Um, and this is a problem that is a lot bigger problem than most people want to admit. Um, I remember in the mid nineties, um, I had the opportunity uh, working with a colleague who was a, who was a, a PhD reliability engineer. And, and we went through five years worth of general aviation accident uh, data, NTSB accident data, uh, and looked at all the accidents in that five-year period, GA accidents, um, that the NTSB attributed to en uh, the accident to, to engine failure, either as the 
either as the uh, probable cause or a contributing factor to the accident. And um, we, we weeded out of there a couple of things. We weeded out uh, air race airplanes and crop dusters uh, to get a kind of a more normal population. And so we, we, we wound up with, uh, I don't remember, 70 or 80 engine failure accidents in that five year period. Um, and about half of them, uh, the NTSB was not able to determine the cause of the engine failure. But in the half that they were able to determine the, the cause, um, about 80% of those engine failure accidents were caused by maintenance induced failures. They, they, they were caused by something that was done wrong in the process of maintenance. Uh, it, was, it was quite interesting. Um, there have been a bunch of studies in terms of how uh, big a problem this is. Um, uh, most people who have looked at this seem to agree that something like three quarters of the accidents are caused by uh, pilot error. Uh, there's no surprise there. Uh, some studies have that number as high as 80%. And that the other roughly quarter of accidents are caused by the machine as opposed to the, the pilot. And of those machine caused accidents, they seem to be split about 50-50 between uh, design related problems and maintenance induced problems. So in, in round numbers, uh, it would be fair to say that something like 10 or 15% of accidents are caused by mechanics. And if you think about it, that's that's really a pretty huge number, 10 or 15% of accidents. That's right up there with 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 stuff like control flight into terrain and and uh and uh, uh attempted VMC into or, or VFR operation into into IMC weather and that, those sorts of things. It's it's a pretty big deal. Um sometimes these things are pretty high profile. Uh Many of you may remember the Aero Peru accident back in 1996 uh, that, that killed 70 people uh, on an airplane, uh, wound up uh, uh, going into the, into the Pacific Ocean, um, and um, turned out that it was caused by some mechanics who had washed the airplane and had put some tape over the static ports in order to prevent water from getting into and then forgot to take the tape off. And as a result, all of the air data instruments in the airplane malfunctioned and the pilots didn't really figure out that the instruments were lying to them and um, they, they wind up, wound up putting the airplane into the drink. It was a very tragic accident. Um, Back at the low end of the aviation food chain, where a lot of us uh, live, um, there are a lot of maintenance-induced failures. Um, I had a client who uh, had a Cessna 182 that he put in the shop. Um, uh, he was putting, having some speed mods put in, some STC speed mods that involved uh, uh, putting on an exhaust fairing and a, and a, a, a speed fairing on the nose gear and stuff and it involved uh, doing a bunch of work on the on the lower uh, the lower cowling uh, so the cowling had been off to get a bunch of work done and um, sometime after that work was done some months later uh, the owner decided to install a digital engine monitor in the aircraft he, he hadn't had one before and when he put this digital engine monitor in the aircraft and, and wound up with, with CHT and EGT probes on all six cylinders and so on, uh, he found to his chagrin that um, all the odd numbered cylinders had sky high cylinder head temperatures. Um, interestingly enough, the factory CHT probe, which was all it had been put in the airplane by the factory, you know, that was really all the CHT information he had had prior to putting this engine monitor in, 
that probe was was on the number two cylinder so it wasn't seeing th these hot chts because if you only have a single CHT probe, you, you have about five chances out of six of not seeing something interesting that, that may be happening. So anyway, he, he was he was extremely concerned that these cylinders were running way, way too hot. Uh, and all of the all of the cylinders on the right bank of the engine. And they started investigating to figure out what the cause of this was. And they uh, ultimately discovered that um, when the lower cowling was all reassembled after all of this work had been done, that a bunch of gaskets had been left out of the carburetor air box, and it was screwing up the, the airflow in the, in the lower cowling and, and, and really messing up the cooling airflow over that right bunch, uh, bank of cylinders. So they were able to uh, obviously uh, correct that, but not until... Uh, those cylinders had been cooking themselves for quite a while, and it turned out that they had been pretty seriously damaged. Uh, the compressions were were low. The borescope inspection revealed uh, uh, a whole bunch of scoring on those on those cylinders, and so ultimately, he wound up having to replace the the right bank of cylinders on this engine uh, because they had been overheated uh, because of this error of om omission in putting the uh, the, the bottom cowling back together after the, the after those mods had been put on. Um, had another client uh, was flying one of the older Cirrus SR22s, uh, the the ones that that had the the instrument six pack in the left instead of all glass cockpit that came later, and uh, those airplanes had a a Sandell um, SN3308 uh, electronic HSI instrument. Uh, down below the attitude indicator. Um, and I know quite a bit about SN 3308s because I had one in my Cessna 310 for many years. I was a, an early adopter of that instrument and, and had it up until, oh, maybe about a year and a half ago when I replaced the attitude indicator and the, and the Sandell EHSI with a, with a pair of, uh, of Garmin GI 275s, which is what I have in the airplane now. But at any rate, the Sandell um, is a, uh, an instrument that uses a projector to project this very pretty image on the, on, on, on the screen. And it has a little projection lamp sitting in the back of the instrument uh, that's supposed to be replaced every 200 hours. So in, in any case, uh, th this guy uh, was complaining that his Sandell was acting up and that that without warning the compass card would suddenly go berserk and start slewing all over the place and and, and lose sync with the horizontal gyro and, and he was losing his heading reference and um, I asked him I said well you know how long has this been going on well, when when did you start noticing that and he thought about it we talked about it a little bit and he realized that that he really started noticing it right after the airplane had gone into the shop to have the 200 hour light bulb replacement done. Um, well, having, having quite a bit of experience with this particular instrument, I was pretty sure I immediately knew what was wrong after he told me that because uh, in order to change the light bulb on the Sandell, you have to pull it out of the rack and the Sandell has this it's a it's a long skinny instrument it, it has kind of a problematic mounting rack uh, that makes it a little bit challenging to get that instrument all the way seated into the rack where the three db connectors on the back of the instrument um, mate with the with the connectors in the back of the rack and it, so if the instrument isn't pressed all the way back into the, firmly into the tray before it tightening the uh, tightening the clamp um, screws um, you can wind up having an intermittent connection with the connectors in the back there that can cause uh, exactly the symptoms that this guy was seeing and um, so I figured that whoever changed a light bulb probably didn't have a lot of experience with Sandell's and didn't realize that it took about three hands and a little bit of uh, fancy footwork to get this instrument re-racked correctly. 
Uh, I told the owner how to loosen the screws and, and re-rack the instrument himself. And I told him what to, what to do to make sure the thing was fully engaged. And of course, he did that himself and, uh, and never had the problem after that. And by the way, the re-racking an instrument like that is is something that an owner is allowed to do under his uh, preventive maintenance authority. Um, the removing and reinstalling rack-mounted avionics is one of the 31 magic things that's listed in Part 43, Appendix A, as preventive maintenance. So it was quite legal for the owner to do this, and he solved the problem. Um, had another client. Um, fellow by the down in Texas who uh, flew a Cessna 340, um, very experienced pilot. Um, and he, uh, he took off one day uh, from his home base um, in, uh, in, in Texas, um, it's in the, generally in the, in the Dallas area, um, with his family. And he was taking off on a, on a vacation trip. Um, it was uh, overcast that day. Um, uh, probably 800 foot ceiling or so. He takes off with his family, uh, everything, the airplane's working fine. He climbs up into the ceiling. He gets up to about 1500 feet and all of a sudden, uh, the all, all of his air data instruments start screwing up. The altimeter freezes and, it, and, and, and the VSI shows no climb and the airspeed indicator starts uh, getting lower and lower, uh, and he pitches up the nose, and and he can't get the airplane to climb, and and it, something is clearly not right. Um, and and he he kind of realizes that that these air data instruments are lying to him, but he doesn't know why. But but he had the presence of mind and the experience to uh, call ATC, declare an emergency, uh, and ask for. Uh, vectors to come back and make a make an ILS approach back into the airport, which which he did, and uh, landed uneventfully. Gave me a call, described to me what happened, and I said, uh, I said, what's the last time you had some work done under the behind the panel? And he stopped for a minute and he said, well, that's a funny thing. You should ask that because. Uh, I just had the airplane in the avionics shop. They re was, were replacing a, a VOR head. And I said, and I, I pretty much knew exactly what was wrong because I'd seen this happen before. And I said, well, why don't you take it back to the avionics shop and tell them to reconnect the, the static line that they disconnected while they were removing the VOR head. Um, if, you, if you disconnect the static line uh, in a pressurized airplane, then the static system is referenced to the cabin and everything will seem to work absolutely perfectly until you climb high enough that the cabin starts to pressurize and then of course the instruments are referenced to the pressurized cabin and uh, and everything goes bonkers um, now this guy kept his cool and did the right thing but there have been at least several accidents that i know of um, where this happened uh, that resulted in, in fatal accidents because the pilots uh, didn't really comprehend what was going on. And in sort of a way, this is a little bit representative, representative of that, uh, or reminiscent of that uh, Aero Peru accident we talked about that where an airliner was lost. So it's pretty serious business. Now, you know, this is, um, an interesting case to talk about for a moment because look, mechanics are human and, and, and it, everybody is capable of forgetting to do something. Um, but there's a regulation that says anytime you open up the static system, uh, you're required to, to do a static, you know, a static leak check. And so, the, the technician that worked on his airplane not only forgot to reconnect the static line, which, which is a which is is a, an omission that you know any anybody could make that mistake, but he also neglected to do the static leak check, which which is an intentional FAR violation. It's a it's 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 a, a cut the corner kind of thing. 
And of course, had he done the static leak check that's required by regulation, he would have caught the fact that the, that the static system had been disconnected, not reconnected, and none of this would have happened. But at any rate, it's a, it's, I thought it was a, a, a story that unfortunately had a happy ending, but there were some lessons learned there. Um, there have been a number of studies of these maintenance-induced failures. There have been a lot of studies of them actually in the airline industry. According to one survey that I looked at, um, more than half of maintenance-induced failures, 56% in a particular study, uh, were errors of omission. In other words, forgetting to do something. Kind of like this static system thing we just looked at. It was an error of omission. Things like fasteners left uninstalled, fasteners hand, put in finger tight but not torqued properly, things left disconnected like the static line, uh, reassembly tasks left undone, that sort of thing. Um, you know, the other half of them are, are kind of a grab bag of, of, of errors of commission, but, uh, but just forgetting to do stuff that should be done is, is one of the most common reasons for these maintenance induced failures. And one of the things that contributes to these errors of omission, I think probably maybe the, even the leading cause of them are distractions. Um, when mechanics are distracted when they're doing their work, it's easy to forget where they left off before the distraction happened. And unfortunately, um, most general aviation maintenance facilities are distraction rich <laughs> environments. There's just all sorts of stuff that, that tend to interrupt mechanics that would not happen, you know, for example, at, a, at an aircraft factory or even at a, a facility like the you know, Citation Service Center in Wichita or something like that. Um, because in small GA shops, uh, the, the, the people tend to wear multiple hats. And they're not only working on airplanes, but they're answering the phone and they're dealing with clients that, that walk in unexpectedly. And then occasionally they are dealing with an FAA inspector who walks in unexpectedly. Uh, the snap on tool truck may come by, the, the road coach may come by. Uh, you know, it's just, there, there's just a lot of distractions. And um, when I started, doing maintenance on my own airplane before I was uh, an A&P myself. Um, but I was just a, a real rookie uh, mechanic. I discovered that when I started working on my own airplane, that the number of maintenance induced failures dropped dramatically, even though I was very inexperienced and really didn't know very much about what I was doing. And the reason was that when I was working on my airplane, I was working all alone in my hangar with uh, probably a Boff Brandenburg concerto on the stereo, no, no phone, no nobody walking in, absolutely. I, I was working in a distraction-free environment in my own hangar, which is a very different environment than what you find in most maintenance shops. So even though I was very inexperienced, I, I also, uh, benefited from having very few distractions. And as a result, uh, the number of maintenance induced failures were much less than what I had been used to back when I was letting other people maintain my airplane. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that I usually uh, advise my clients to do is to try never to pick up their airplane from the shop on a Friday, <laughs> because that's when everybody else wants around a maintenance shop on a Friday, you'll see that it is literally a, a, an orgy of buttoning up airplanes and trying to ship them out the door for all of these customers that are, that are waiting to pick up their airplanes and tapping their, their, their feet. And that kind of uh, pressure is a perfect setup uh, for, for errors of omission, for forgetting stuff because you're in a hurry and because there's a lot of distractions going on. So I always try to advise my clients, if you possibly can, pick up your airplane almost any other time but a Friday and the likelihood of them um, forgetting to, you know, tighten an inspection plates or forgetting to tighten uh, cowling fasteners or leaving circuit breakers pulled or whatever is, is gonna be much less because the, they'll have 
fewer distractions on other days of the week than, than Friday as a general rule. Um, you know, there was, there's been some remarkable research in this whole area of maintenance-induced failures, although it wasn't called that. Um, uh, but one of the more interesting things that happened was 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 back in the in the early days of uh, of uh, World War II. Um, there was a group of scientists headed headed up by a guy named C. H. Waddington um, that that wound up. Uh, he was actually a biologist, but he, he wound up being uh, uh, pulled into the war and it headed up a group of researchers that were assigned to the uh, uh, the RCAF uh, Coastal Command in uh, in Britain. And um, he his group was tasked at looking at uh, why their squadron of B-24 Liberator bombers that they were using uh, in anti-submarine warfare, why, why those airplanes, uh, why half of them were not mission ready at any given time because they were, they were sitting in, in, in the shop with, with maintenance issues or waiting for parts or that sort of thing. They, they, these airplanes were, were pretty much hangar queens. So of course these scientists, they didn't know anything about maintenance, but they knew a lot of stuff about science and statistics and, and, and how to research things. So they started investigating why these airplanes were, were, were uh, having so many maintenance problems. And uh, one of the things that they discovered was, was quite interesting and it became known as the Waddington effect. Um, and that was that when they, they, they analyzed the, the relationship between um, squawks unscheduled uh, repairs and the number of hours since the airplane had last been in for its uh, its 50 hour uh, preventive maintenance cycle they discovered that the further out from the 50 hour maintenance cycle that the airplane was the fewer squawks it had and they concluded that the, the lion's share of the squawks were being caused by the maintenance itself. In other words, the maintenance, this preventive maintenance that was supposed to be preventing problems was actually creating problems. And so they made a bunch of very um, revolutionary recommendations to, to the commanders uh, to extend the maintenance intervals and to eliminate an awful lot of the preventive maintenance that, that had been previously being done and and to only do preventive maintenance that could demonstrably prove that it was doing more good than harm as opposed to the other way around and the 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 mechanics were squawking like crazy because this this violated all the conventional wisdom the commanders uh to their credit took the scientists advice and made these changes to the policy and as a result the the um uh, the force readiness of that of that B-24 group uh, went up by something like you know, 60, 65 percent. It was very dramatic. Um, all of this stuff was basically hidden away. It was all classified until uh, not too long ago. Um, but the, the same thing was independently rediscovered in the 60s by, um, uh, by a couple of scientists at United Airlines. Uh, a fellow by the name of Stan Nolan, who's an aeronautical engineer, and Howard Heap, who was a math mathematician who specialized in statistical analysis. This was right when United was switching from recips to jets, and although most of the airliners were the, the airlines were going to Boeing 707s, uh, uh, United was going to the DC-8, and uh, they asked Nolan and Heap to uh, study the way maintenance was being done on these airplanes and see if they could make some recommendations for how it could be done in a more efficient fashion. Um, and the more they looked, the more they just determined that, that the way the maintenance was done was, was, uh, was causing more problems than it solved. And they made a bunch of recommendations that pretty much revolutionized the way uh, United was doing maintenance and eventually revolutionized how maintenance was done in the in the air carrier industry in general. Uh, and they created this 
this uh, uh, engineering protocol called Reliability Centered Maintenance, or RCM. Uh, there are now lots of textbooks on RCM. There are all sorts of RCM consultants around. RCM, although it was originated in the airline industry, has now gone way, way beyond aviation and, and is used in maintaining all sorts of things from water treatment plants to nuclear power plants to, you know, all sorts of anything that's that's mission critical and maintenance intensive. Um, and it's basically the science of, of, of how to do maintenance in an optimum fashion uh, in order to achieve the desired level of safety and reliability uh, by doing the, the least amount of, of, of maintenance possible to, to achieve that. And it's, it's pretty interesting. I, I've done some webinars on it. I, my first book called Manifesto talked uh, a lot about liability centered maintenance. Um, at any rate, Every mechanic has made mistakes that have caused maintenance-induced failures. Um, uh, I know I have, uh, and it doesn't mean they're bad mechanics. Um, it, it just means they're human. Some of the best mechanics that I have ever met have, have, have made some of these mistakes, and uh, it, it just it's it, it's it happens. Um, and mechanics generally don't like to talk about mistakes. They're, they're a little bit different than pilots in my experience, because I've you know, i been a pilot longer than I've been a mechanic. And pilots, we talk about accidents and accident causes and stuff all the time. I, I'm a, uh, an NTSB accident report junkie. I, I subscribe to a publication called the NTSB Reporter. And I, and I, I just devour these things because pilots, you know, tend to feel that the more we the, the more we study accidents that, that other pilots make them the, the better prepared we are to not let those things happen ourselves uh, mechanics tend to be a lot less willing to talk about mistakes I, I think perhaps because of concern about liability i mean when pilots make mistakes, they, they're, they're usually the, the first one to arrive at the scene of the accident. When mechanics make mistakes, it's usually somebody else that gets hurt. Um, but it, but it, making mistakes is just something that, that happens uh, because mechanics like pilots, we're, we're humans, we're not infallible. Um, but I think admitting that we're capable of making mistakes that can cause maintenance-induced failures is the first step to becoming a, a better uh, and, and minimizing the uh, the incidence of these things. And our goal as mechanics must always be to make fewer mistakes and and to because distractions are such a big issue to permit fewer distractions. I know some maintenance shops, for example, that we work with, where where they have a rule that that when the mechanics show up to work, they have to check their cell phones <laughs> and they can get them back at lunch hour, but they have to check them again when they come back from lunch. And that may seem a little bit paternalistic, but uh, you know, phones are just a huge source of, of, of distractions and distractions can, can cause accidents in, in this business. So we have to take it seriously. Um, talk a little bit about some of the problems that we see. I mean, maintenance news failures pretty much span the gamut of all, just about everything you can think of. But uh, spark plugs, um, the, the act of removing and reinstalling spark plugs, which we do as a matter of preventive maintenance, often will we'll break loose debris that fall into conduct combustion chamber and will typically find their way to the bottom spark plugs uh, that are at the low point of the combustion chamber and wind up fouling the spark plugs. And this typically will show up on the, the first pre-flight run up after maintenance. Um, uh, the pilot will, will come back and say, I'm getting a bad, a bad bag mag drop and it will turn out that there's some, some junk in a bottom spark plug. Fuel injection nozzles, that's, that's something I was, I was always taught that, and, and most of the service manuals recommend that, that fuel nozzles should be removed and cleaned periodically. Um, I think the Continental recommendations every 200 hours, 
we were supposed to put the nozzles in a little ultrasonic cleaner full of Hoppy's number nine uh, uh, gun cleaner and, and so on. And, but what we've found is that that is a, a preventive maintenance item that does more harm than good because the most common single cause of clogged fuel nozzles is contamination that occurs during the course of removing and reinstalling the nozzles. Uh, and in fact, you know, nozzles don't really want to be clogged up. They've got a very effective solvent running through them all the time. Uh, and typically the only time they get clogged up is when some foreign material gets in the fuel system. And it's almost impossible for foreign material to get to the nozzles when the system is uh, is together because the fuel goes through three progressively finer levels of filtration once at the at the tank pickup once at the gascolator their fuel strainer and then uh, through a very fine uh, screen in the fuel control unit before it finally gets to the nozzle so typically when foreign material clogs the nozzles it got there during maintenance uh, so opening up the fuel system every 200 hours for the purpose of cleaning nozzles is, is pretty much an invitation to, to cause a problem. So our recommendation is never to clean nozzles prophylactically, uh, but, but only to clean them when, the, when, when an engine monitor indication indicates that, that one of the cylinders is running leaner than the other ones. Um, and by not cleaning the nozzles, unless it, they demonstrably require cleaning, uh, we, we eliminate the, uh, the huge number of the problems that, that we were seeing back when we were cleaning nozzles on a, on a, on a uh, you know, every 200 hours. Um, we see tons of problems with mag timing being off. Um, we, we try to educate aircraft owners how to detect the situation um, and and with an engine monitor it's very easy to detect if 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 the timing is is uh, advanced more than it should be which is the more harmful of the two errors uh, you, you'll see elevated cylinder head temperature and depressed exhaust gas temperature and if if the mag timing is retarded you'll see the opposite low chts and high egts but in any case, if, if we, we tell owners, if, if the EGTs and CHTs are not what you expected them to be after you get the plane out of maintenance where the mag timing was touched, typically annuals and stuff, you know, bring it back and have them recheck the timing. And the mag timing has to be done very precisely. Um, uh, a degree of difference in mag timing makes a significant difference. Um, the, the tolerance that, that we want to see mags time to is plus zero and minus one degree. And it's literally impossible to get the timing anywhere close to that accurate using one of these old old fashioned flower pot uh, timing uh, you know, wheels with a, with, a, with a pointer and the pendulum on it. You're lucky if you can get within a few degrees with something like that. And, and if the pivot on the pointer isn't, isn't absolutely free it, uh, you, you can get all sorts of errors plus certain plus you get parallax errors depending on exactly which way you look at that thing so we always recommend using a, a, a accurate digital inclinometer which you can buy for 30 bucks at home depot that is accurate to a tenth of a degree um, and, and taking the timing very very seriously um, we've been seeing particularly a rash of problems with, with grossly uh, inaccurate mag timing on airplanes that have been retro retrofitted with electronic ignition systems like, like the, the, um, the Surefly or the Electro Air system. Um, and it's not because there's anything wrong with those systems. It's because the timing procedure for those systems is different than for conventional tractor mags. And a lot of mechanics don't have very much experience with timing the the, the EISs because they're pretty new, and so they 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 they, they tend to mess them up uh, a lot more frequently. And we've seen you know grotesque uh, timing problems where the where, where where the you know the timing is 
is advanced by 10 or 15 degrees from what it's supposed to be, which is pretty much enough to, to, to blow up an engine. Um, so we, we need to take this stuff very seriously and we see a lot of problems with it. Um, a lot of kind of dumb things that you see, uh, uh, very common, anytime a bottom cowling is off, if there are landing and taxi lights in that cowling, it's very easy to forget to reconnect the, the, the connector the, to provide power to those things. And then the, the, the maintenance induced error may not be even noticed until the first time that the pilot winds up flying at night and discovers he doesn't have landing and taxi lights. Um, here's one we've I've seen any number of times. Uh, we, we do a lot of, of turbocharged cirruses uh, in our practice. And um, uh, during um, uh, routine maintenance, it's often necessary to, to disconnect the, uh, the, the induction couplings that go to the intercoolers in order to get the intercoolers out of the way to have good access to the rear spark plugs. Um, and uh, that, that's kind of an accident waiting to happen because you put, if you put that back together and you don't get the hose clamp on, on the right side of that bead, uh, the, the coupling will look like it's in place. Everything will look fine. You know, you tighten the clamps, but if the clamp is a little bit mispositioned, what happens is the, the, the airplane runs just fine until the first time it climbs up to, to high altitude and at high altitude where there's a significant pressure differential between inside those induction tubes and, 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 uh, and outside ambient, uh, the coupling blows apart and all of a sudden the, the airplane goes normally aspirated and has a 10 or 15 inch loss, uncommanded loss of manifold pressure and the pilot winds up having to declare an emergency. And we've just seen this, seen, seen this tons of times. It's a very, very easy mistake to make. Um, so it's one of these things that you just have to double and triple check because it's just, it's, it's, it's almost a trap for mechanics. Uh, here's one we've seen a lot. Uh, the pilots will pull, this is a Cessna 210, the pilot will pull the hydraulic pump breaker during maintenance. And then because it's kind of down by the fuel selector, not exactly on high level, we'll forget to push the breaker in. And uh, the uh, pilot finds out about this when he goes to extend the gear and it doesn't extend. And uh, if he's really thorough, he'll spot the problem, and if he's not really thorough, he, he may have a, a serious issue. Uh, this is not exactly a maintenance-induced failure. It's a, it is a mechanic-induced <laughs> issue. This is a case of a, of a mechanic who uh, took this this tail dragger out for a uh, uh, for a, a post annual uh, engine run up uh, and uh, applied full power. Um, holding the brakes but uh, neglected to uh, to pull the stick all the way back and the of course the airplane majestically uh, started to tilt nose down and once it does that there isn't anything you can do but but watch so the the, sh the shop wound up having to to do an engine tear down and put a new propeller on it very embarrassing um and i'll 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 conclude with this one um, this, this was kind of a head scratch and it was kind of unfortunate, but, uh, it involved a, uh, a, uh, a Cessna TTX, the, the Columbia 400 that has gone under a whole bunch of different names, uh, since Cessna bought it. Um, and th this airplane has a Hobbs meter in it as standard equipment that is driven off of an oil pressure switch. Um, uh, to you know, record flight hours. And for some reason, the owner of this airplane, um, and I think he was using it for training or something, but he, he requested that a second hops meter be installed. So there was a little discussion between the owner and the shop, how they want the second hops meter to work. Did they want it to, to record um, 
whenever the master switch was on or did they want it to only run when the engine was running which would be done with an oil pressure switch and the conclusion was it should be done with an oil pressure switch um so the shop went to install a second hops meter and for some reason they decided that they needed to install a second oil pressure switch now it seems to me if i was doing this first of all i'm not clear why he would want two hops meters that would be running in tandem but if i was doing this i would just hook the two hops meters to the same oil pressure switch it was already in the airplane but for some reason uh they uh, the, the shop concluded that in order to put in a second hops meter they need to put in a second oil pressure switch so they um removed the oil pressure switch that was factory installed and and uh, and and wound up uh, using a, a a couple of AN fittings, a, a nipple and a T, uh, so that the the two oil pressure switches could could measure the same oil pressure where the where the one had been before. Um, unfortunately, the uh, AN fittings that they used were these blue ones, uh, which means that they were made of aluminum. All the other AN fittings in this area of the engine are steel. Um, and there's a good reason that they were steel. Uh, this aluminum fitting with the weight of these two oil pressure switches in a very high vibration environment uh, hanging off the back of the oil cooler of this engine, um, that nipple wound up fatigue fracturing in flight. Um, all the engine went over, all the engine oil went overboard and uh, the engine seized. Uh, fortunately, the um, the pilot uh, was able to make a, a, a dead stick, uneventful dead stick landing. Um, but the uh, the shop's insurance company uh, needed to buy a new engine. This the engine was, of course, was trashed by by this thing. So again, sometimes these maintenance induced failures can be uh, can be pretty serious. So let's be careful out there. Um, the, we need we need to, to to try to prevent these from happening as much as we can. And as I said, one of the one of the biggest things we can do is try to minimize distractions when we're working on airplanes. And uh, that's all the prepared material I have, guys. Um, I'd be glad to open it up for some Q and A. I, I did want to mention that um, uh, together with a couple of my colleagues. Uh, 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 Paul New and Colleen Sterling, uh, the three of us are doing a monthly podcast for AOPA uh, called Ask the ANPs, and it's a it's a call-in show. We we actually modeled it after the old NPR car, car talk program, where we invite um, aircraft owners to uh, uh, to call in with with questions, and we try to answer them, and we try to do it in a way where we have a little fun in the in the process. So um, if you're interested in listening to it, you can get it on Spotify or, or Apple um, podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're interested in uh, in participating and asking a question, uh, send the questions to podcast at AOPA.org. And our producer, Ian Twombly, if he likes your question, we'll uh, we'll put you on the show and we can we can have a little fun. And uh, my four books are are available um, on Amazon, also in the EAA bookstore and at Aircraft Spruce. So, if if you're interested, uh, that's where you can get them. And um, with that, why don't we uh, open it up for a little Q and A and see whether I have provoked any interest here. Jeremy, you there? Yes, sir. You okay. Go ahead and close your screen if you're able uh, to. I'm going to do that. Oh, let's see here. Close my. And I would answer and say yes. You you have provoked some. Uh, and quite a bit. Here. <laughs> Turn this thing on. Okay. So let me know when you're ready for the first question. Okay, you can see me now. I'm ready. I, I see. <laughs> I don't know what I have to do to be ready. Can I drink so, my? Can I drink you know, my cold coffee while we're doing this? It's all impromptu. So, you know, first a comment and a thanks more than anything for your time. And um, 
I appreciate you dedicating everything that you do for aviation, you know, promoting aviation education and safety, trying to mitigate um, and reduce incidents and accidents from happening. Because, you know, a, it's not a FAA inspector, but a game warden told me in high school that he <laughs> believed that the best way to get people to do the right thing is through education, not always necessary, not necessarily legislation. So talking to people, having conversations, give the give folks the inspiration to want to do the right thing when no one's watching i got a question for you and it's from donald and his his question is is what is the recommended protocol for returning an idle two-year 0320 to airworthiness status um well that's an interesting question uh i actually uh, wrote an article um for AOPA pilot, and I also did an EAA webinar on the subject uh, that I think was titled Power Plant Resurrection. <laughs> and it, it, it was addressing exactly uh, this particular question. Uh, so if the, uh, if the fellow who asked the question uh, wants to uh, drop me an email, I'll be glad to, to uh, send him a link to the, to the article. Or if you just Google Mike Bush Power Plant Resurrection, I imagine it will probably take you right to it. Um, but we, we talk about how to, the, the various ways to, to, uh, to fog the, the engine with aerosol lubricant and so on to try to get a little bit of uh, a pre-lube on the cam and in the, in, the, uh, in the cylinders and so on. And then of course, the, when you're resurrecting an engine like that, the big thing that the biggest thing that we're concerned about is whether there have, has been any corrosion pitting on the cam and lifters that will cause them to come apart. Um, in Continentals, you can actually pull the lifters and take a look at them. In, in Lycomings, you can't do that without splitting the case. So what 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 we do is we just uh, um, watch the oil filter really, really closely for the first hundred hours. And uh, if, if it's if the cam and lifters are gonna come apart, they're gonna come apart pretty quickly and leave quite a bit of ferrous metal in the filter. And if you get through the first hundred hours and there isn't ferrous metal in the filter, you can you can take a deep breath and decide that you dodged the bullet and fly on happily into the sunset. <laughs> Okay, so um, Mike, I've got um, I've got one from you, and it's actually I'm going to quote your title of chapter three in your maintenance manifesto book. And the chapter for everybody is do um, do piston engine TBOs make sense? And um, we've got a perfect scenario. Ask is the first uh, first question here, which is a sixty five E model Mooney IO three sixty mm -hmm. engine at twenty seven hundred hours since major overhaul. Mm -hmm. And the mechanic is uh, is is a little scared that uh, the owner is going to end up in a in in the field someplace <laughs> and and not able to get home. But uh, engines running smoothly, oil analysis every you know it's burn a quart of oil every eight to ten hours. Uh, oil analysis is done, comes up good. Compressions are all better than seventy. Runs smoothly. Lean a peak. An engine monitor um, says everything looks good. So I just wanted to kind of open that up for you to just kind of comment on your on your chapter there. Okay. Well, I mean, the, the the first comment that I would certainly make is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It sounds like this engine is healthy. Um, the uh, the 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 study that I mentioned to you that 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 we did in the mid '90s, where we looked at five years worth of accident failure data, um, made it very very clear that if you are going to fall out of the sky because of an engine failure, uh, it is almost always going to be when the engine is young, not when it's old. The infant mortality risk of newly built engines is vastly greater than the age-related risk of old engines. Uh, in fact, the main reason, as I mentioned, that old engines run out or fall out of the sky is not because they're old, but because uh, mechanics did something to them. You know, the, they they did a top overhaul, for example. So one of my favorite ways to fall out of the sky is to do a top overhaul <laughs> because it is so easy to screw up. 
and the results can be so totally catastrophic. Um, so, um, you know, that the, the, that engine sounds like it's, it's healthy. If, it, you know, I, and, and I practice what I preach. I, I, the, the two engines in my Cessna 310, uh, one engine I overhauled at, at, at about 230% of TBO and, and the other one is still trucking. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's the, the um, uh, but you know, if you are going to throw uh, TBO out the window, which is what I recommend you do, I, uh, the FAA does not require part 91 operators to pay, pay the slightest uh, attention to TBO, and my recommendation is not to pay the slightest attention to TBO because it's a, a fundamentally flawed concept. But if you're going to maintain the engine on condition, which is what I recommend, then you, you sort of have taken on an obligation to use all of the tools that we have uh, for monitoring condition. So you should be cutting open the filter religiously, you should be doing bore scope inspections religiously, you should be getting oil analysis um, and, and uh, you know, all of the, the tools that we have. And we've got these wonderful tools now for um, a determining the condition of the engine. And if we are able to determine the condition of the engine accurately, which we are, then there's no reason to be arbitrarily euthanizing engines at some magic number that the that the manufacturer throws out. You know, some engines are not going to make it to TBO. Some engines are going to go two, three, four times TBO if if they're given an opportunity to do that. The the, the small four cylinder light homings, if they're in a flight school, for example, where they fly almost every day, um, they. they uh, it's it's common to see those engines go four or five thousand hours and never have a cylinder off of them. Um, but an airplane that that sits around, especially if it's on a tie down in Florida, it, it <laughs> probably isn't going to make it to, to TBO because the the biggest reason that our uh, GA engines don't make P TBO is corrosion, which is a combination of not using them enough and having them live in a in a in a corrosive environment um in fact when 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 we are are helping people buy airplanes we have a pretty big pre-buy program we always try to convince them you know if you possibly can don't buy a florida airplane you know <laughs> buy, buy buy a colorado airplane or an arizona airplane or new mexico airplane you know? <laughs> uh, because corrosion is such a huge problem now that's not to say that an airplane can't live long and prosper in Florida, but to do that, it has to fly a lot and it has to live in a hangar. Um, it, it's, it's, the corrosion is just, a, is, is, is the, the, the big killer of, of, uh, of engines in the, in the, uh, in the owner flow and GA fleet. Um, but, uh, the, the concept of TBO is, is just basically so flawed because it's, the, the manufacturers throw out these one size fits all numbers that that say, hey, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether the airplane lives in 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 Tampa or Tucson, and it doesn't matter whether the airplane flies, you know, ten hours a year or four hundred hours a year. They all get the same TBO. Well, that's silly. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. And so, to me, the best thing you can do is ignore TBO. And, 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 and do things on condition and do the best job you possibly can of, of determining condition. Excellent. Yeah. One of the questions that was asked was any tips for a renter who rents an airplane after an annual or a hundred hour, or uh, you did a presentation on your post maintenance checklist. Uh, maybe you can carry over from that presentation to answer that question or however you see fit, but like say you, you, you have a non-aircraft owner who rents an airplane from a flight school and it just came out a 100 hour annual. I mean, that's obviously something to consider. Right, I, my recommendation is don't be the test pilot, you know, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the first flight after uh, maintenance is always a test flight. There is nothing that drives me crazier than having one of our clients get his airplane out of the shop after a heavy annual inspection where all sorts of invasive stuff was done 
and then pack his his wife, his kids, and his dogs in there and fly off to the Bahamas. I mean, what part of post maintenance test flight did he not understand? And I've I've done seminars and webinars and articles and stuff about all the bad things that happen to airplanes on the first flight out of maintenance. But if the airplane is gonna is gonna um, fail you, the most likely time is going to be right when it comes out of maintenance. And, uh, uh, you know, m most people have some sense of that. You know, if, if, if I said to you, um, hey, I've got this brand new uh, 2021 Cirrus SR22T just came out of the factory at Duluth, and I would like you to ferry it to France you would probably say, you know, <laughs> I'd feel a little better if we put a hundred hours on that thing before we took it over the pond, right? I mean, it's right. common sense. We we need we but we need to understand that that we face that same kind of a dilemma, not only when the airplane first comes out of the factory, but every time it comes out of an annual inspection. Because mechanics are taking stuff apart and putting stuff together. And anytime you take stuff apart and put it back together, there's always a chance that it won't go together right. And, and, and it turns out that that happens a lot more than anybody wants to admit. So we need to take this post-maintenance test flight stuff seriously. Um, I was married for 40 years and, and uh, I, I remember I, I would uh, spend several weeks taking my airplane apart every year and going through the annual inspection and putting it back together. And I would, I, I, I would finally tell my wife, I said, well, I just, I just buttoned up the cowling and tomorrow I get to take it up for the, the post maintenance test flight. She always looked at me and she said, couldn't you get somebody else to do that? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I figured since I was the one that took it apart and put it back together, I ought to be the one to take it up for the test flight. But uh, we need to take that, that test flight stuff seriously. Uh, airplanes, right. when they first come out of maintenance, are, are just inherently unreliable, and and we need to treat them that way. I, I don't think, I mean, to me, a post-maintenance test flight is one that's, that's done with only required flight crew in good day VFR conditions, and most importantly, with a test pilot's mindset, where, where you're spring-loaded to the abort position. You know, you just know something's going to go wrong. That is is not the flight that you want to be taking up a primary student. That's just not that, that that's that's just poor judgment to do that. Unfortunately, that probably happens way more than it should. Oh, I bet it does. Because of the almighty minutia. <laughs> um, so a thought that I had while you were talking here um, is that MIFs basically sound like the Swiss cheese model of errors and catching errors. Um, you know, we talk about um, safety when you're aviating um, in that you assume that mistakes will happen. You will, you will have oversights, admit that they will happen. And thus you put in multiple layers of checks, yeah. which themselves will be flawed, but you know, Swiss cheese model, you will, you will eventually catch, catch a problem before it becomes an issue. It, it sounds, similar with with myths and that you basically don't have an industry that wants to talk about making mistakes and doesn't have some of these safety these checks in place to catch them when they do happen what what basically yeah one of the things you mentioned is basically coat checking your cell phone when you come through the door <laughs> at the beginning of the day and, and back from back from lunch any other kinds of things like that that we should really be doing in the maintenance industry, well, or I mean, that we can affect. Th there's a lot of stuff that we should be doing, but the question is how much of it can we afford? I mean, I, I was speaking earlier of, about the, the, the difference in distractions between, say, a, a typical piston uh, GA maintenance shop uh, and, say, a citation service center, and, and it's a big difference. But 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 an, another difference, which is 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 maybe even more significant, um, if if you if you spend some time hanging out at the citation service center, I don't mean to 
pick on citation. It could be a Gulfstream service center, or it could be an aircraft factory. Um, but everything that's done to those airplanes, either that are being maintained or that are being built, have three sets of eyes on them. Because typically the, 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 the technicians uh, who are often not A and P, so they're often repairmen, but they're, they work in pairs. And then when they get done, and they check one another's work, and then when they get done, an inspector comes in and has to inspect the stuff. And the inspector works for a different department, and he's basically not even allowed to talk to the technicians. There's just this big brick wall between the, 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 te the techs and the inspectors, uh, intentionally so. Um, so everything is, is, has three sets of eyes on it. If you go into a, into a, a piston GA maintenance job, usually there's only one set of eyes that ever gets on anything, and that's the set of eyes that has the wrench in his hand. And mm -hmm. that's just the way it is. And can we, you know, if, can can somebody flying a Cherokee 140 afford the cost of three sets of eyes? I don't know the answer to that. It, it might be difficult. But we do have to recognize that at the low end of the aviation food chain, a lot of things happen that are not optimal. Uh, there, there's... There's not a lot of cross-checking and there are too many distractions. So as owners, what can we do to affect it if we don't, if we're not changing where our maintenance is done? Is it, is it uh, the mindset basically test pilot, do a test flight? Well, the, the, the owner is the last line of defense. Mm -hmm. he, he typically is the test pilot. We, we, you know, there are some shops that we work with that, that, test fly the airplanes before they deliver it to the owners? Um, very few. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I bet it's less than 10% of the shops that we work with actually fly the airplanes. And most of the shops we work with don't even have access to, to any kind of pilots to, to do that. Um, I, I, lost, I lost my thoughts. Sorry uh, that's... <laughs> So it's it's really just so it, what I, the summary I took away. But I, the other thing I wanted to say is that owners they, they need to understand that this, that this is an imperfect process, mm -hmm. and they need to have maintain a high degree of skepticism about it. And and part of that is is this business about having a test pilot mindset when you first fly the airplane when it comes out of maintenance, because the the chances that something won't work right is is actually pretty significant. What screw ups do you see most commonly? I know that's kind of a broad question, but that was a question that was asked, and you know, it leaves you. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I, I sort of tried to to go through a sort of a grab bag of of different things. It, it's funny because I uh, we we have twenty eight IAs working for my company. <laughs> And uh, and I, I I circulated an email uh, last week, knowing that I was going to do this, and I said, you know, tell me what your favorite maintenance-induced failure is, and you wouldn't believe <laughs> you wouldn't believe what came in. It was just amazing. I could only scratch the surface, but everybody yeah. had stories to tell, and of course. Uh, nobody ever said I did this. They always said, well, I, I know of something <laughs> did this, you know, that's just the way it is. It's, I got a friend, right? Um, but uh, just all sorts of things. I mean, I, I, I didn't even talk about some of the most trivial things. I don't want to tell you how many times we've had airplanes come in after the first flight out of maintenance and a bunch of inspection plates are bent backwards because they were just hanging there by one screw. And, <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we, one of the things first flight out of maintenance you should do is you, you should do the most thorough pre-flight you can possibly imagine, um, just on the assumption that stuff is going to have been left unsecured and untightened and, and stuff. But, um, you know, it's, it's, there's a limit to how much you can check during a pre-flight and it kind of depends on airplane. If you're lucky enough to say fly a Bonanza or, or a Cessna 310, like I fly that 
you know, there are big barn doors on the side of the cowlings. You can open up and get a really good look at what's going on in the engine compartment. But if you're flying a, a Cessna 210 or, or God help you, one of those Columbia 400s, you know, pretty much all you can see in there is, is whether the oil filler cap is, is on or not. You, you just, there's no way to see anything. So um, that's actually one of the reasons I, I, I love to see aircraft owners do their own oil changes and, and preventive maintenance like that because, because at least, you know, once every 50 hours, they actually get to lay eyeballs on all of that stuff um, that, that we can't typically lay eyeballs on. Uh, during pre-flight so it's it, doing your own oil change is kind of like advanced pre-flight you're looking in there to see if there's anything leaking or anything burning or anything chafing you know but, and you can't do that enough um you know i've always it, 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 at the low end of the food chain we we do these annual inspections which as opposed to phase inspections that, that are done on on larger aircraft and the annual inspection is, again, it's sort of a flawed concept it, it, because th there's a lot of stuff we inspect way more often than it needs to be inspected. And then there's other stuff that we inspect way less often than it needs to be inspected. Pretty much anything firewall forward, you can't inspect it enough because it, it's trying to sh shake itself and burn itself apart all the time. <laughs> And then there's other stuff, you know, that that lives a very docile environment, and and really, you know, if we checked it every three or four years, that would probably be enough because pretty much all that can happen is it can corrode. Um, but there are high stress points on the airplane, and and certainly firewall forward and wheels and brakes are the two most obvious cases where where we really need to look at them as often as possible. On that topic of changing oil, how about mystery oil and, and additives and anything that you can think of, the theories behind adding uh, to the fuel or the oil to improve the lifespan or get the compressions up on an engine? What's your thoughts on that? Are you talking about miracles in a can? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I've also heard. It um, I'm not a yeah, but most, uh, you know, most uh, aftermarket additive, um, I, I don't particularly recommend. Some of them I feel neutral on because although there's no evidence that they do any good, there's also no evidence that they do anything bad. So um, the, the, the one aftermarket additive that I'm personally a big fan of because, because it's, it's proven itself to me in, in a very controlled test environment is, uh, is, is something called CamGuard, which is a, 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 an aftermarket additive package that is probably the best um, anti-corrosion additive package that, that, that is out there. And corrosion is, as I mentioned, kind of the big killer of engines in, in, in the owner flown fleet because we don't fly enough and we fly too irregularly. And um, the cam guard uh, really, really helps with that. Um, I, I know for many, many years, I had years of history of, of, of oil analysis. And every year when my airplane was down for its annual inspection, and it tended to be down for a fairly long time because I was working on it myself. It was a piston twin with way too many moving parts. <laughs> And I'm the world's slowest mechanic. So when you add all those things together, the airplane was typically down for quite a few weeks during its annual inspection. And I live eight miles from the Pacific Ocean. So it's a you know, fairly high corrosion environment. And so the, no, no big surprise, the, the, you know, the first um, uh, oil sample after the annual w would always have a big iron spike in it. And, you know, and I kind of expected it and then it would normalize out the rest of the year. And then at the next annual inspection, it would spike up again. I started to use CamGuard and the spike went away. That, that made a believer out of me. That, that was pretty dramatic. And I've seen, I've seen the same thing in, in, in several other airplanes. So I know it's just not, it, it's not just me. So I've been a big believer in using CamGuard in my airplane. Um, but um, 
the, the, the additives that I kind of actively discourage people from using are, are the, the ones that, that have uh, Teflon or PTFE in them because the uh, Teflon, first of all, it, it doesn't really work as an engine additive, but what's worse than that, uh, PTFE has the, uh, the unfortunate characteristic that the, the, that the molecules can, can flock together is something called Teflon flocking and create things that can plug fine passages like in hydraulic lifters and so on. And DuPont who makes the stuff uh, is very, very clear that they don't want it to be used as an oil additive. And, uh, um, but there, there are other additives like, like Av blend and stuff that we've tested quite a bit. Doesn't, we, we can't, we, we can't, see any evidence that it does any good, but we also can't see any evidence that it hurts anything. So, you know, if it, if it makes you feel warm and fuzzy or makes you sleep better at night, then, then I don't have any problem with you pouring it in. And Marvel Mystery Oil is kind of in that same category. By the way, it's not a mystery anymore. No, there are no mystery oils anymore. You just right. look, go Google it and, and there's a, there's an <laughs> MSDS that tells you exactly what's in it. So there's right. no, and then Marvel Mystery Oil has some, you know, food coloring in it and has some perfume <laughs> and yeah. stuff like that, you know, but, um, but as far as I know, it doesn't hurt anything. So I'm going to kind of start with the basis of a question we have in the chat here. Um, it summarizes, how old is too old? Um, the scenario described as a Cetabria with a um, o235 engine that's getting close to 50 year old, 50 years old and still running well. Are there accessories that you start to worry about or anything else outside of the engine that that ages? And if so, how do you monitor and check those? Um, well, I mean, the, sure, the accessories tend tend to, not last as long as the engine itself. Uh, I, I don't know what we're talking about as accessories, but for example, magnetos really need to come off the engine and get taken all apart every 500 hours. Magnetos are a particularly serious issue because they're, the, there's two problems with magnetos. Full of, first of all, they're full of plastic parts that, that, that break pretty easily. Yeah. And second of all, they're unlike the engine itself, there's no non-invasive way of determining the condition of magneto. We, we, we can't check the filter on a magneto because they don't have a filter. We, we can't stick a borescope in there because there's no place to stick the borescope. We, we really can't tell. Uh, the magneto is really a black box unless we take it apart. And so it's one of those exception things that uh, where, although I really hate taking stuff apart on a, on a routine basis, magnetos are just one of the things that we need to take apart um, every 500 hours or so to both to, to be able to inspect what's going on in there. And also there are, magnetos have, have consumables in them, uh, I'll call them. They've got things like carbon brushes that wear out that need to be mm -hmm. replaced. They have felts that need to be saturated with oil and that, that dry out after a while. They have uh, condensers or capacitors that have typically a, like, like a 10 year lifespan and then, then the, elect, then, then the uh, dielectric starts to break down. Um, so magnetos really have to, have to come apart on a regular basis and it, magnetos are a, a really weird uh, case because the argument, you know, the, there would be a reasonable argument that says we really don't have to do preventive maintenance on magnetos because we have two of them. And so if one of them fails, we've got a backup. And normally when you have a 100% redundancy, uh, a, a run to failure philosophy is a perfectly reasonable philosophy. For example, that's what I do with vacuum pumps on my 310. You know, I've got two vacuum pumps and one vacuum pump is enough to run the system. So um, I don't, 
I don't try to do any preventive maintenance and vacuum pumps. I, I run them till they fail. And I, I by the way, I carry a spear in the wing locker just in case. <laughs> but but uh, but magnetos are are different because e although we have two of them, and so although theoretically we have hundred percent redundancy, magnetos have some unfortunate failure modes to them. It, it, it's if 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 the only way a magneto failed was to just quit, then it wouldn't be a problem. That then then I'd run them to failure, because if a magneto quits, you got another one, and you probably hardly even notice unless you looked at the engine monitor and saw that your EGTs rose fifty to hundred degrees because you're running on one plug. Mm -hmm. But magnetos have these failure modes that can make the engine go absolutely berserk. Uh, you, you shed a tooth off of a distributor gear. And, and now the magneto is is firing whatever plug it feels like at whatever time it feels like and um and even even with those sorts of failure modes if the pilot had the presence of mind to shut off one magneto and then the other and say oh yeah this one's the bad one that's the good one i'm going to shut the bad one off he wouldn't have a problem but what experience shows is that pilots don't have that presence of mind um, th there was a, a couple of year period where I tracked this very closely. We had about a dozen of these mag failures and they occurred with pilots of all kinds of experience levels from, from very low time guys to very high time guys to flight instructors. They happened in the pattern. They happened in the flight levels. They, they I mean, they, it pretty much spanned the gamut of possibilities. And in not one single case did the pilot have the presence of mind to isolate the bag magneto and shut it off. Hmm. In fact, the one that happened at the flight levels, it was a, it was a Cirrus and it was up uh, it, it, over flying Ohio. And, and the, the guy declared an emergency and he, it took him, I think 29 minutes to get down and land at Lincoln airport. So he had a half an hour to think about this. And he still never figured out that if he shut this one magneto off, the engine would run fine. Um, so because of the fact that, you know, the redundancy only works if the pilot, you know, makes it work <laughs> and, and experience seems to show that that doesn't happen. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't, um, take a run to failure philosophy on on magnetos even though we theoretically have 100 percent redundancy it's, it's just a peculiar situation and i suspect the um the lesson of what you're doing and during run-up where you're i you see know, jeremy turning, smiling about when you're turning to the left <laughs> when you're turning to the left mag the right mag um I, I i guess the the lesson of what you're doing is is lost on how that applies how that could be used <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, it's it's it, when an engine's going berserk, the last thing pilots want to do is shut something off. You know, it's just <laughs> it's just human nature. Been there, but, you know. That. It's it's because yeah. it's like this is this is really a training problem in in my mind. You know, because be, because if if an airplane is stalling, the last thing a pilot wants to do is shove the nose down. But we're trained to do that. That's mm -hmm. what keeps us alive. Well, we need to be trained to do this other stuff too, but we aren't. <laughs> It's just a hole in the in in, in, the, in yeah. the pilot training, I think. You know, what you're talking about is a confidence thing because I had a hundred hours and I had a mag fail with me at 700 feet on takeoff and a 172 when I was a young buck, and it did exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. The inside of the magneto disintegrated and it threw the timing off or something. The engine was just detonating and backfiring and all kinds of stuff, and I just did a very shallow 180 and came back and land on the calm wind runway yeah as opposed to just reaching down and swapping the mags over and of course i didn't panic but i was alarmed <laughs> and you know the the overarching concern is is that if you start messing with the mags the prop is going to go you know up down it's not gonna yeah. continue well, to win and, now. and and look I'm, I'm the first person to to say that you know when something goes wrong your first order of business is to fly the airplane and, and troubleshooting the problem exactly. is a secondary thing. And you didn't have a co-pilot to, to say, I'll fly the airplane, you troubleshoot or vice versa. You just had to, had to 
prioritize it yourself. So, but, one of, you know, it, exactly what you're saying. And when, you, when it refers to training, I try to train my students for that. And if I get the opportunity to take them up on a twin and go shut an engine down and say, look, you can turn the engine off and the prop is going to continue to spin. It's not going to shut off. And, and that helps build that confidence. And, mm -hmm. and uh, multi-engine training, I think, does a really good job of building the confidence of really understanding that the engine isn't just going to stop. Which you I, know what else? You know what else builds confidence? What's that? The flying gliders. Oh, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> I got a glider rating. And, yeah, me too. Uh, and uh you know that's that's really a lot of fun you know I, yeah i got my training out in el paso yeah you, you you learn how to use the rudder for one thing you sure do <laughs> you sure do and you learn how to use thermals and you le learn how to use mountain wave out mm -hmm. in the parts where i learned um but you're right um and then of course you learn a lot about flying when you become a helicopter pilot when the machine is trying to kill you from the moment mm -hmm. you start turning rudder blades <laughs> <laughs> What you got for us to close out? Uh, I think we're coming up on the nine o'clock hour and and uh, you got anything else you'd like to add? I got one final question for you for a close out. Uh, no, I've had fun. Yeah. And uh, anybody who, uh, you know, needs a question answered that didn't get answered or one that you didn't occur to me, uh, occur to you, just feel free to drop me an email. Uh, Mike, M-I-K-E dot Bush, B-U-S-C-H at SavvyAviation.com. Can you say the name of your podcast again? The podcast is called Ask Me A&Ps, and it's produced by AOPA. It comes out on the first of every month. We do it once a month. And this video will be, this webinar will be uploaded to the All American Aviation YouTube channel here in the next few days. And then it'll be pushed out along uh, on the distro. So those of you who are first time attendees tonight, you'll get an email from the All-American Aviation um, email distro. And I'll include uh, Mike's information, his email, so that you can ask the question. Because there's a lot of questions and a lot of comments. And mm -hmm. I'm really uh, apologetic to all of the folks who participated in that we didn't get around to asking your questions. That's just kind of the nature of this animal because we had somewhere close to 200 and 25 people total to log in tonight and of course it fluctuated between 150 and 160 uh, cons uh folks that stayed in uh consistently uh so we had a really good turnout for those of you who were attending tonight and i really appreciate your time the last question i'm going to ask and it's a question i always enjoy asking um our audience is you know, on the spectrum between student pilot ATP, uh, some are military, some of them are, are uh, you know, Bush pilots. What is Mike Bush's definition of a professional pilot? Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I consider myself a professional pilot and I don't I get paid to, I don't get paid to fly. Um, but I, I, the, the reason I consider myself a professional pilot is because because I take my flying very seriously. Excellent. Um, and um, one of the things that does sort of, it's kind of a hot button of mine and probably shouldn't be because uh, I'm probably a little thin skinned about it, <laughs> is, is when people talk about flying as a hobby. Uh, I, I think it's it's too serious to be considered a hobby you know uh you you either you either need to be really fully committed to it or you probably shouldn't be doing it there there are things like that i mean when, when i was learning to be a mechanic uh, i i i had to learn to weld in order to pass my my a and p practical test and i very quickly discovered that welding is one of those things that you either have to do all the time or you shouldn't be doing it on a real airplane <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of feel similarly about aviation you need to either take it very seriously or you probably shouldn't be doing it I agree and I am a professional pilot I do get paid but I am a professional pilot not because I get paid hmm. and I always try to uh, influence my students to 
to try to embrace that concept that a student pilot can be a professional. And I try to influence them that it's basically about having a code of ethics, about doing the right thing when no one's watching. That's what I try to yeah. leave my students with. Yeah. Yeah. And as a flight instructor, of course, you, you, you have to set the example because people will do what you do, not what you say. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Mike, anything else before we close out? No, I've, I've enjoyed it, Jeremy. Yes, sir. We'll I really again appreciate sometime. I really appreciate your time this evening. We'll have you back here in, you know, six months or so, if that works for you. Sounds great. All right. Let me go ahead and close this out for the evening. Okay. And thank you, Eric. You know, thank you very much. You're completely welcome. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending tonight. That's uh, Mr. Mike Bush. He's the owner of Savvy Aviation and he has four books. And then of course I'll push out an email with all of the information uh, Mike's contact information. And uh, if you could go ahead and drop me a note if you've got questions of flyallamerican at gmail.com. Follow the All American Aviation channel on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. And join us on October 26 at 7 30 p.m. as I welcome uh, television chief meteorologist JP Dice as he comes to talk about aviation weather. From Eric and Mike Bush, myself, and all of those who regularly join, thank you. Have a wonderful night. We'll leave nothing for tomorrow, which can be done today from President Abraham Lincoln. Have a wonderful night. Good night, ladies and gentlemen.